There, they have the world's most powerful laser. And what they uh -huh. do with a bunch of these lasers is they aim them all at a tiny target and they cause the target to explode. One December morning, the word fusion filled every headline and even the world's biggest skeptics had to pause. A blunt, restless voice wondered if this was real hope or just another tease that would vanish at the last second. The question mattered because the climate crisis has made good news feel rare. If fusion truly crossed a line, it could reshape energy, industry, and life. But what exactly happened? Where did it happen? And why did scientists call it historic? This story follows the physics, the machines, and the hard truth behind the hype, step by step, without the fog. Fusion hits the news. The buzz started with a simple question. Was the world being given a reason to hope, or was it being set up for disappointment again? The answer traced back to a place built for both secrecy and precision. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. Among the national labs, this one carries a heavy job as a steward of the United States nuclear stockpile, which means it studies nuclear materials and how they behave. That work is funded through the Department of Energy, not the Department of Defense, a detail that surprises many people and shows how defense spending can hide in more than one budget. Inside that lab sits a machine that sounds like science fiction but runs on careful engineering. A laser system so powerful it can deliver an immense burst of light in a tiny instant. The goal this time was not to test a weapon. The goal was to prove a piece of physics that could unlock a new way to make energy. When officials held a formal press conference led by the US. Secretary of Energy, it signaled that the result was not a lab rumor or a flashy press release. It was a milestone meant for the public record. The moment landed in early December 2022, a date many scientists expect to remember the way people remember the first flight or the first steps on the moon. A tiny target and a storm of light. The method used at Livermore is called inertial confinement fusion, and it begins with something almost comically small. A pellet-sized target holds fuel, usually forms of hydrogen, and it must be made with extreme uniformity. Dozens of laser beams strike that target at nearly the same time. To casual ears, it sounds like an explosion, and in a way it is, but the real trick is what the outward blast does next. If the heating is even, the outer layer blows off symmetrically, and that outward push creates an equal inward shove. That inward shove becomes an implosion that crushes the fuel for a brief moment under huge pressure and temperature. For a heartbeat of time, the fuel behaves less like a gas and more like a compressed burning star core. This is why perfect symmetry matters. If one side heats more than another, the pellet squashes unevenly, the pressure leaks out, and the reaction fizzles. The lab has spent decades learning how to shape that light, time it, and aim it so the target collapses the right way. People inside the field often joke that the place runs on lasers, lasers, and more lasers, because so much progress depends on pushing laser science forward. In this setup, lasers are not used to heat a room or cut metal. They are used to create the fastest, cleanest squeeze that human hands can build. Why fusion needs extreme heat? At the heart of the story sits a problem that looks simple, until it is faced directly. Hydrogen nuclei carry a positive charge, and positive charges push each other away. Trying to fuse two light nuclei is like trying to force two strong magnets together on the wrong ends. They rush close, then snap apart. Physics calls this barrier electrical repulsion, and it is why fusion is not easy to start on demand. A helpful image is a ball rolling up a hill. If the ball is pushed gently, it climbs a little, slows, and rolls back down. If it is pushed harder, it climbs higher. Only when it has enough energy does it crest the hill and fall to the other side. Fusion works the same way. Raising the temperature makes particles move faster. Faster motion lets nuclei get closer before the repulsion turns them away. At a critical point, when two nuclei come extremely close, a different force takes control. It is one of nature's fundamental forces, the strong nuclear force. It acts only across the tiny distance of a nucleus, but inside that range it can overpower the repulsion and bind particles together. That is the moment when two light nuclei can become a heavier nucleus, like forms of hydrogen combining into helium. 
The whole reaction depends on reaching that narrow doorway where the strong force can grab hold and lock the new nucleus in place. When mass becomes usable energy. Once fusion finally happens, the surprise is not only that atoms merge, but that the accounting does not balance in the usual way. The products of the reaction have slightly less mass than the fuel that went in. That missing mass does not vanish. It turns into energy, just as Einstein's equation links mass and energy. In practical terms, a tiny amount of matter can become a large burst of heat and radiation. This is also why the sun shines every second of its life. In the sun, gravity provides steady pressure and temperature, so fusion can continue for billions of years. On Earth, machines must fake those conditions for a short moment. The Livermore experiment mattered because the numbers crossed a symbolic line. Scientists compared the energy delivered to the target by the laser pulse with the energy released by fusion in the fuel. For the first time in that facility, the fusion yield was greater than the laser energy that struck the target, roughly 50% higher. That result is often described as achieving net energy gain for that specific step of the process. It did not mean a city could plug into the machine the next day, because the full system still spends much more energy powering the lasers and supporting hardware. But it proved that the core physics can pay back energy instead of eating it. To engineers, that is a loud message. If the reaction can be made repeatable, and if the machine can be made efficient, then a power plant is no longer a fantasy. It becomes a design problem. From weapons to a working reactor, fusion itself is not new. Humanity learned the basic recipe long ago, and by the middle of the 20th century, it had already been used in the most violent form imaginable. Thermonuclear weapons, often called hydrogen bombs, release fusion energy in an uncontrolled flash. That history created a strange situation. The world knew how to trigger fusion, yet could not guide it. The real challenge became control. A utility company cannot run a power grid on a reaction that behaves like a bomb. A reactor must be able to start, sustain, and stop. It must contain the heat, protect its walls, and manage the flood of fast particles that fusion creates. In other words, it needs a throttle, not a detonation. That is why the Livermore result felt like a pivot point. It suggested that a controlled fusion system can be pushed into a regime where it gives back more energy than it receives at the fuel level. Pop culture has teased this dream for years. One famous image shows a tiny home fusion device powering a time-traveling car, fed with everyday trash. That scene is fiction, but it captures a real desire, a compact source of clean energy that turns common inputs into power. Actual reactors will not run on banana peels, yet the core idea remains. If fusion can be controlled, it could provide dense energy without burning coal, oil or gas, and without the long-lived waste profile of today's fission reactors. The remaining gap is brutal engineering's, not magic. Why December 2022 may matter for everyone. The climate angle is what made the announcement feel personal. Fusion does not rely on combustion, so it does not produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct. If a future grid used fusion at scale, it could slow the growth of greenhouse gases while still supplying huge amounts of energy for homes, factories, and transport. That would not erase past damage overnight. Carbon dioxide has already been absorbed by the oceans, and the ocean and air trade that gas back and forth until they reach balance. Even if atmospheric levels drop, some dissolved carbon can return to the air over time, which means recovery is a long project, not a quick fix. Still, clean power changes what is possible. It lowers the cost of running direct air capture, producing clean fuels, and electrifying hard-to-convert industries. That is why many people marked the first and second week of December 2022 as a date worth remembering, not for fear, but for progress. The fact that national leaders highlighted it publicly reinforced the point. This was not only a laboratory story, but it was also a civilization story, and it opens a wider cosmic lesson. Fusion makes energy by combining small atoms. Fission makes energy by splitting very large atoms. Somewhere between those extremes sits a turning point, where squeezing atoms together stops giving energy and starts costing it. 
That boundary helps explain why massive stars eventually lose the fight against gravity, setting the stage for their most dramatic endings. Fusion on Earth is tied to the life and death of stars. Years from now, people may point to early December 2022 as the weak fusion stepped from theory into proof. The result did not solve the climate crisis, and it did not deliver instant power plants. It did something quieter. It showed that physics can work, and the next battles belong to engineers. That kind of shift slowly rewrites the future. If repeatable, efficient fusion arrives, it could power cities with far less carbon and more security. Until then, the sky offers a reminder. Stars keep fusing non-stop, and the search continues. Someday, that same fire may run safely on Earth. 